and welcome to Rock Creek Online. Thank you for joining us today. In just a moment, we're gonna hear a great talk, but first take a minute and tell us where you're watching from. As you watch today, we want you to know that we've been praying for you and we believe God is going to speak to you through today's teaching. And just a reminder, if you're ever in the Marysville area, we would love for you to join us in person for church. But for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's teaching. Thank you for making Rock Creek a part of your spiritual growth. Hey, Rock Creek Church, Pastor Brian here. We're so glad you joined us wherever you're watching from. If you're on social media, hey, make sure you let us know where you're watching from, who you're watching with. Uh, if you're on our YouTube uh, channel, we're so glad, again, you're tuning in. Hey, if you're driving your vehicle, pull on over, finish watching this conversation, and then get back to whatever you were doing, uh, errands or, or running to the grocery store, whatever. We're so glad you made Rock Creek a part of your spiritual growth in this moment together. Okay, before we get into the, the brand new series we're kicking off today called For Better or For Worse, I just want to give you a couple highlights of things, really important things that are coming up, which the first one I'm most excited about, it's fall season of groups, which means you got to join one. We're not a church that has groups, we're a church that's made up of groups, and so registration is officially open, and here's the good news, um, they're going to fill up fast, uh, and so you, 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 need to, you need to sign up today, uh, get in a group today, because if you don't, uh, the group that you want to be in may not be available because there are limits to our groups because they're not massive. Uh, they're a little bit smaller to make our church feel a little bit more connected. And so again, I want you to join a group. Registration, you can go to look for the link. Wherever you're watching from, look for the link. Go right now, sign up for a group, and, and they kick off in a couple weeks. But registration is open for only two weeks, and then we're going to shut it down. Also, men's night coming up, September 23rd. It's going to be amazing. Just the men. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be a really good time. We're going to have food. We're going to have uh, some, some great Bible teaching from me. Uh, we're going to have some worship. It's going to just be an incredible evening together. We've never done a men's night, so this is the first one. So don't miss out on the very first uh, moment together with the men gathering on a Friday night. It'll be a good time. I already have a great message for you, and you don't want to miss it, okay? Also, water baptisms, October 2nd, the first Sunday in October. It's going to be incredible as we watch people make a public declaration of that inner decision. We say it this way around Rock Creek. You be publicly marked in water baptisms, and so we like to celebrate. And so if you've made a decision to follow Jesus, but have never followed his example of being water baptized, that is the weekend for you to show up in person We'll celebrate you. It's going to be an incredible time. Bring your family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, stranger on the street, the person who bags your groceries. Invite them to watch you take that public step of, of declaring you're a follower of Christ. And so those are some awesome things coming up. Okay, let's talk about what it means uh, to have better and not worse. I think a lot of people settle for the worse in relationships instead of, instead of the better. Now, I know some of you watching today maybe aren't married and you're like, well, is this series relevant for me? It's relevant for everyone. And I know every pastor probably says that when they do a, a phrase like this that has to do with marriage. But the truth is, whether you're single, uh, single again, you, you've had, maybe ha been married and now you're single again. Maybe you're single and looking to mingle or you're married. Whatever your status of relationship, as complicated as it might be, um, this is going to be helpful for you. Because if you're single, we're going to give you some really good insights of what you should be looking for. If you're single again where you're probably going to recognize some things that maybe you didn't get right the first round, but hey, come on, there's always another option, there's always another time for you. Um, and, and if you're in a dating relationship, this is going to help you to go, oh man, we are heading the wrong direction, or we're heading the right direction, which is really God's direction for your relationship. And so whether it's friendship, marriage, uh, single, this is going to be relevant and, and for everyone. And, and here's kind of the view I'm going to give you over this this series, is really that 30,000 foot level view. And so there's always going to be exceptions. I know some of you are going to have stories. you be like, well, that doesn't count for me because this is my specific story and my specific relationship. And so this series is not meant to address some of the little um, minutia of, of, of every relationship. It's going to give you the 30,000 foot view um, of like, here's the biblical truths and principles from the Bible about relationships. And so if you'll follow this, you'll have a better chance of having God's best for you in your friendships, in your marriage, in, in any relationship, um, and, and it'll help you, okay? So that's kind of the overall uh, uh, summarization of where we're going in this series called For Better or For Worse. Okay, so let's read our theme scripture, Ephesians 5, 
For husbands, this means love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church, he gave up his life for her. So already we're seeing kind of some things that you can just kind of glance at and go, okay, this, this, we're going to go somewhere. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. So again, married people, this is for you, single people, um, this is what you need to think about as you progress in the dating relationships. Uh, if you're single again, this is going to be helpful to go, this is what I'm looking for if we jump into a marriage again. Okay, Proverbs 18, 22, one of my favorite scriptures, the man who finds a wife finds a treasure, and he receives favor from the Lord. Okay, and so we, it's important for us to understand that, that like, being married is a gift from God, finding that spouse is a gift from God. It's a treasure. And so for the married people today, I want you to think in terms of your spouse is a gift. Your spouse is a treasure. Now, you may have had the worst fight of your life this morning, this last night, this week. And you're thinking, I don't know if it's treasure. If it is, it's buried, right? Like, okay, we're going to help you uh, see treasure and gift from God again in your spouse. But, but unfortunately, there's, there's what I call two relationship extremes when it comes to our world. And, and, and typically, we see this in culture either one way or the other. And, and the first one is what I call the swipe right, okay? And if you don't know what that is, that means you're young and you've never heard of apps like Tinder or Snapchat or TikTok, and, and that's okay. But there is this swipe right cultural trend that, that hasn't been new, but it's, but it's gotten more intense, which is basically what I call hookup culture. It's like almost swipe right, find someone to take home tonight and do what feels good with no commitment, no connection. It's sheer physicality. Okay, so there's this swipe right. That's an extreme when it comes to relationships. That you're going to have a, a partner not based on mutual respect and love, but based on attraction and what we call lust. And so that's the swipe right culture. That's one extreme I think we see in, in relationships in culture today, specifically in our Western culture. The, the other one we see is what I call apocalyptic romance. Okay, you'll never forget this, these two points. Swipe right and apocalyptic romance. What is apocalyptic romance? Um, it's obsession with, with finding value that's derived from your relationship with someone else. So, like, it would be weird. I've been married almost 17 years. This is, we're in the year 17. It would be weird if I woke up every morning and my wife's hovering over me going, tell me how great I am. Tell me that you love me again. T tell me that you would marry me all over. Like, whoa, whoa, I, I just want to wake up first, right? Like, like, if she found her value fully from me, uh, two things will happen. One, she's going to be discouraged because I won't be able to provide what she's looking for. Two, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crack under the pressure of that kind of relationship. And so we see this apocalyptic romance, that romance in the movies is not real, it's apocalyptic. It's, it's not natural, it's not God's way of design when it comes to romance or relationships. And so we see these two extremes, either you're obsessed and you find value and worth through that relationship, and again, only two results. One, you don't find what you're looking for, and two, the pressure of finding that value and worth from someone else or through someone else, it crushes them. Right? Or you have the swipe right culture, which is what do whatever feels good, do more of what makes you happy, and, and, and take home whoever you want, or with as many people as you want, and, and it's all physical, there's no connection, there's no love, there's no commitment. The Bible word is covenant, there's no co co covenant between you and that person or persons. i got to just say it because culture is, is moving a particular way when it comes to relationships. Okay, so I want us to get away from these two extremes and land in what I call the biblical standard, the biblical values of relationships. So look what Romans 12, 2 says. Now I'm going to read it from a, 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 it's really not a translation, but it's what we call the Amplified. So they, they give emphasis to you, to the scripture so that you understand it better, okay? And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. How good is this scripture? 
I mean, you want to read the Amplified every day? You should, because honestly, it just gives us a really good uh, understanding, a, a functional view of this amazing scripture out of the book of Romans. Hey, hey, don't be like the world. Be in it, but be distinct from it. How do we get distinct from it? Well, we don't buy into the superficial values that if she looks good, then, then go home with her. If he looks good and got the 12-pack the abs, if that even was a thing, like go home. You don't need connection. You don't need love. You don't need commitment. You don't need, you don't need covenant. Like whatever looks good and feels good, do that. Like that's the superficial values and customs of the world. That's not the Christian way of living. So, so be progressively changed, right, in, into mature spiritual people. Because before you are a physical person, you have a spiritual being inside of you. And so we got to understand the godly values and, and ethical attitudes that, that prove that we are Christians. And so Christian, I'm talking to you just for a moment in this, in, in this conversation together. Your life should prove to everyone in your world that you have bought into godly values, his attitudes he has for you, and that you want his plan and purpose for your life more than you want what's best for your physical self and human urges and surges. And so when it comes to relationships, don't swipe right. When it comes to relationships, don't settle for apocalyptic romance because they're going to disappoint you and you're going to overwhelm them with the pressure to, to give you what you cannot get from them. And, and so there's this beautiful definition. There, there's an ingredient when it comes to what makes a great marriage. And so again, we're going to talk about marriage in this first foundation because you got to see it from God's perspective. And then, and then we're going to build on that over the next uh, few weeks together. And, and so if you're not married, this is, this is for you. If you're single again, this is for you. This is how you know you got what God wants for you. And if you are married, come on, it's time to evaluate how are we doing? Genesis 2.18 says it this way. Then the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. Like, I love that. Okay, so God created the world, including all the animals and the fish and all that stuff. And then he created man and he thought, my gosh, uh, he needs some help. Right? And all the ladies said, amen. Like, he's not good by himself. Now, I've given him all the animals and all that stuff, and he's still, like, there's something like, that he just needs. And so God says, I'm going to make a helper, a companion, a partner, someone who's comparable to him that will be just right for him. So, so when you decide to get married, here's what you're really saying, okay? And maybe you didn't have this talk in your premarital uh, marriage counseling if you had that before you got married, but, but let me give it to you now. When you get married, what you're saying is out of the 7 billion people in this world, I am choosing you to fight with <laughs> the most. I'm choosing you to love and serve forever. Um, it's okay to, to fight in your marriage, and we're going to talk about that next week when we talk about conflict, okay? But that's next week. You're, you're choosing this one person over the other 7 billion people in this world. To It's you and you alone. You are just right for me. Now, now that takes a little bit of faith. Some of you are like, well, I've never thought about my marriage this way, and you're, you're, I feel the pressure. Like, okay, don't, because I'm going to give you the three ingredients I believe that God gives us through this word about what makes a great marriage. And, and so you get to evaluate now as we, as we learn from the Bible what God uh, wants our marriages to look like. And, and the first element is what I call friendship. Friendship. And I'll put it this way. You prefer one another over everyone else. So, so friendship is an important part of, of, an, of a godly marriage, not just a healthy marriage, because there's a lot of great counselors and therapists, and there's books, and I'm going to quote a bunch of books that I've read that will help you, and, and that's all well and, and good. But like what God says, friendship is one of the foundational things, and, and what we'll see from the, from the stuff I'm going to give you from other books, and not just Christian authors, but like science and data and people who are secular, like they actually confirm what God says is that friendship is one of the most important ingredients to a healthy, long-lasting, vibrant, passionate marriage. That you prefer one another 
over everyone else. Now, I know some of you, when you got married, you're like, I was out with the guys every night, and you got married, and all of a sudden, your wife looked at you and says, hey, what are we, what are we doing tonight? Let's just cuddle in on a Friday night and have some tea and a chick flick. And you thought, my gosh, I've made a mistake, <laughs> right? Uh, I understand. And so, like, you, but, like, friendship is cultivated. It's why I always tell people when I do premarital counseling with people, and I've done a lot over the last 20 one years, um, I say, hey, don't, don't skip the friendship stage and get to the romance. Because if you, if you skip the friendship stage in the dating process and the relating process and, and in the process of dis- deciding, discerning whether this person is the one for you out of the seven billion people, the one that God has for you that will be just right for you, if you skip the friendship stage, actually the foundation what you're building on is not actually the best ingredient. It's not the best ingredient. And so friendship, this, this, this inside desire to spend more time with that person that you said I do to than anyone else it has to be cultivated. It has to be developed. It, it, it's why we see a lot of marriages about the 18 to 20 year mark get divorced because their entire world has been about their kids or their work. And so, so we see when, when the kids leave the home, they look at each other and go, well, I'm not sure if I love you, let alone like you. They haven't cultivated friendship. And and so there's a lot of times that we look at our kids and say, hey, mom and dad are leaving for a couple days. And and we're going on vacation. We just were on one recently. And uh, and we looked at each other and said, we're going to make it. We're going to keep doing this. And and my love language is to actually be away without my kids. That's like really how I get to enjoy life with with my wife. But like friendship has to be developed. Look what it says in Genesis 2. At last... The man exclaimed, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. So, so God gave Adam this gift. He's like, finally. <laughs> like, like, where have you been, uh, God, on this whole creation thing? Like, I've been waiting for this person, this this perfect fit for me, this comparable helpmate, this friend, this friend. John Gottman, uh, a great uh, therapist and counselor, has written books, and, uh, and, and his stats are staggering. His accuracy is, is honestly hard to comp- compete with and compare to. He can sit with a couple, this is what he says, he can sit with a couple for about 20 minutes, and 99% of the time can, can actually tell you whether your marriage will survive the next few years or not. And so this is what he says about happy marriages. Happy marriages are based on a deep friendship. Deep friendship, not not just surface level. By this, I mean, he says, a mutual respect for for and enjoyment of each other's company. So so happy marriages. Because I entitled this talk, Marriage or Misery, and a lot of people settle for misery instead of happy marriage. Or you hear phrases like happy wife, happy life. No, no, happy marriage. It takes two. Not just one, to have a happy marriage. And happy marriages, ones that are vibrant and thriving and passionate, are based on deep friendship. Friendship that actually says, I not only like you, but I enjoy being in your presence. I like being in your company. I I like just being around you. I just like being in the same room. I like being at the same spot. I like... So it's this idea of delight, not duty. It's this idea of passion for, not passivity for. Like, like, I want you to be passionate for your spouse, not be passive in it. There's no neutral ground when it comes to developing deep friendships in your marriage because it is a secret ingredient. It's probably the most important ingredient of a healthy marriage is friendship. And so it's got to be this delight, not duty, this passion, not this passive. Uh. But, but so, so here's the, the challenge of friendship because I think some of you are probably watching going, well, we had a friendship at some point, but we've drifted apart and I'm, I'm not sure why, but, but it's not where we need to be. Maybe you're evaluating. It's, it's not where we be, and I've already decided it's not where we need to be just based on the 10 minutes you've been talking to us today. Well, so I'm, I'm glad you asked. What's the challenge of, of having a deep friendship in your marriage? What's well, this, that you're created differently? You're created differently. I don't know if you knew that. You're different. <laughs> and, and, and let me say this. Remember this. Uh, different, not wrong. Okay? You're created differently. So when God looked at Adam and says, man, there's something about 
him that like he needs some help. <laughs> and it's not that Jerry Maguire, like, you complete me. It's not that. It's not that at all. But, but God created men and women to be different. Look what Genesis 127 says. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. This is not a political statement. This is a reality of life. There's two options, either you're male or female. That's the way God designed it. That's God's original intent. No matter what the world or culture might tell you, this is it. Male or female. Man, woman, boy, girl. That's it. And as you know, there's differences between these two options. Male and female. And so why is friendship hard? Because you're different. Look what Elizabeth Carroll says out of her book, The Marriage Boot Camp. We found that relationship problems can often be traced to the differences in our gender traits. Okay, so there's this, <laughs> there's this gender trait between male and female that's just different. It's challenging. It's, it's guys are this way, girls are this way, men are this way, women are this way. And, and so we have to understand the differences. In her book, she says this, that like, women typically have a tendency to be more of a nurturer than, than men. It's why if you uh, find like a preteen gal and they say, have you ever changed a diaper in your life? They're like, all the time, like, like constantly. Like my daughter, who's going to be eight soon, like has babies for days. And, and she walked out of her room the other day and had a, a baby carrier with two babies on her and about had a, a, a panic attack going, what are you doing? You cannot leave this house with a baby carrier and babies on you. You're eight. But there's just something about the intrinsic nature of a woman that has a nurture built in. Has a nurture built in. So by the time they get to the preteen, they're like, I've changed a thousand diapers. Listen, if you ask a 14-year-old dude, okay, maybe you're watching you that age, like, hey, have you ever changed a diaper? They're like, no. The first time most men will ever change a diaper is when they have their first baby. <laughs> and even then, we try to get out of it, right? Why? Because it's not in our nature. It's, 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 it's called the mama bear instinct, right? It's why we could be at the lake, and a kid could be drowning. And the dad's sitting over there, talking, and not, not even paying and the mom is running, and saves her child, and does like, what happened? <laughs> right? Like, who won the game, right? There's no game on. You're at the lake, right? It's because it's just not in us. There's, there's differences in the nature and genetic makeup of a man and a woman. Actually, there's a book called The Female Brain, and um, it's a very interesting book, and I have a daughter, so I'm trying to figure out <laughs> how to figure this out. And so she actually says there is a difference even in the brain makeup of how the female brain works and the male brain works. And so your brain is split up in left and right hemisphere. And there's this neural pathway, okay, called, called the colossum, where, where really, really, it's the network that they talk in your brain. And, and so here's what she says in her book, The Female Brain. She, this, is, this is just straight science, biology. The estrogen, when in, introduced or passed in the body of a woman, it actually makes the, the network stronger. And there's more connection and it's clearer in the female brain, which her case is that women are smarter <laughs> than men. And all the ladies watching said amen to that. And so it's just, it's just the nature of it. But testosterone, which is primarily in men, when, when that starts moving around in the brain, <laughs> actually makes the network not as, not as clear, <laughs> which is why I can look in the fridge and be like, I don't see it. I don't see the ketchup bottle. I don't see the orange juice. I don't see the milk. I don't see my wallet. I don't see my keys. Cause, cause like it just sometimes just doesn't connect, right? Like there's moments in my life where I can just be like, uh. Now I will admit I'm not the easiest person to live with, but 17 years my wife has figured out a way to manage. And so women just have this connection as the estrogen gets moved around in their body, the clear connection, and and men are just like, uh, I don't know, why, which is why God says, Hey, I think he needs some help. <laughs> I think he needs a a helper that will be just right for him. Which is why most marriages sometimes get it wrong. Because you're like, this person's different. Yes, exactly. God made it that way. That you're different for a reason. To be a comparable helpmate, a partner that fits just right. But friendship is not based on those differences. Friendship is based on how God has wired us to be in relationship. And so don't make the difference 
the problem. I could say it this way. Don't make the person the problem in your relationship. Make the problem the problem. And develop that deep friendship so that you can have a happy marriage. It's not wrong. It's just different. The second ingredient I want to talk about is partnership. And I put it this way. It magnifies your strengths and minimizes your weaknesses. Now, originally I had it just weakness, but for some of us, we, we have more than one. <laughs> and so I added weaknesses because some of us are not like Jesus yet. And so we got more than one. And that's okay, but because the marriage, God's intent in instituting and establishing marriage from the beginning of time was that we would have a partner who magnifies our strengths and minimizes our weaknesses. Now, I know some of you watching are like, well, that's not the marriage that I have, which is why you're single again, and, and I understand that. And so this is God's best for marriage. So as you think about your singleness, which we're going to talk about later in this series, as you think about your marriage, ask yourself, am I magnifying the strengths of my partner, my spouse, or, or am I magnifying the weaknesses? Am I minimizing the weaknesses, or am I blowing them up? It's important for us to realize that, that God gives us a partner in our marriage. Genesis 128 says it this way, then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. So he goes, hey, hey, work together, become partners, be fruitful and multiply. And also, by the way, fill the earth and govern it. So, so I'm going to put you, this is the greatest, God puts them in a garden, buck naked, <laughs> and says, uh, she's just right for you. <laughs> and he's like, uh, it's about time, God, <laughs> right? God blessed them and says, now make a lot of babies and, and fill the earth with them. Like, be partners in this thing called life. Matthew 19, 4 through 6 says it this way. Haven't you read the scriptures, Jesus replied. They record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves the father and his mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. So listen, you have a partnership in your marriage that you're not supposed to let anything or anyone split apart. Like I said, this is a 30,000 foot view. Because some of us have some nuances and have experienced the splitting apart, and we're still working through that, and God's grace is available for you, and God's going to work through you and heal what's hurt and help you get back and restore relationships. But like the, for the regular intent that God has for marriage, it's this, that we would leave <laughs> our parental connection and be joined in partnership and friendship to our spouse. God made it that way. When he made the man, he made the woman. He's like, okay, this is, this is how I want it to work. And when it works like this, it's really good. When it works like this, it's really healthy. When it works like this, my gosh, you can do more together than you can apart. Tim Keller in his book, The Meaning of Marriage, says it this way. Marriage has the power to set the course of your life as a whole. If your marriage is strong, even if all the circumstances in your life around you are filled with trouble and weakness, it won't matter, he says. You'll be able to move out into the world in strength. So when you have a partner, no matter what you face or what you go through, the challenges, the circumstances, the uneasiness of this thing called life, you can move out in strength. Why? Because you have a partner. A partner. See, but there are some challenges when it comes to partnership. And so I, I want to address them because... Sometimes preachers and pastors and well-meaning leaders will inspire you. Okay, be a, let your sp spouse be a partner. Yeah, but like, what if they don't want to be? <laughs> what if it's not working that way? Well, well here's the, a couple reasons, and this is the one where there's multiple challenges. Again, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this first one because we're going to talk about it next week. But communication is the number one challenge I see when it comes to, to partnership. Why? Because not only are we me created differently, um, we also don't, don't communicate clearly. The ultimate illusion of life is that we've communicated clearly to people, particularly in this context of marriage, our, our significant others. And I always use this example that 
that uh, men are like boxes in a garage. It's all separate, and uh, the fall is approaching, and so I know I'm getting prepared to put Christmas lights up. Christmas lights that are jumbled up in a ball that you have to all untwine probably better represents a, a, a woman. <laughs> so the guys can easily compartmentalize our life while the woman is it's all connected and it's all jumbled and it's all related, which is why the kids can be screaming in the morning while they're getting ready for school and the husband can get up and go, hey, wanna, wanna have some fun? <laughs> and she's like, I haven't even brushed my teeth yet. Don't you hear the kids screaming? Who's gonna make them breakfast? And the husband's like, well, so is that a yes <laughs> or a no? <laughs> Why? Because we're just different. We compartmentalize. <laughs> you, can, you can put the boxes separately, but the woman is all connected. It's all connected. And so it's important for us to remember that, that gosh, there's just differences between us. And when things are not going well in life as a whole, it's a little bit harder to be partners from a woman's perspective. And, and, and the man, we just have an easier time of, of disconnecting things from each other. Disconnecting things from each other. And so I think when it comes to communication, you need to realize there's two types. There's the, the logical and the emotional. And the logical is, is much more given to men, which again, gender differences as men, uh, I'm much more logical. And for most women, they're much more emotional when it comes to our communication. So I can come home and go, hey, uh, where are we going for dinner? And, and, and my spouse can look at me and go, Would, do, you, do you not like my cooking? <laughs> right, like, my question was logical. Hers was emotional. It's, it's why when, when your spouse asks you, um, uh, do I look good in this dress? Like, <laughs> be careful, because <laughs> you're going logical, but there's some emotion connected there. And so if you answer logical, you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> There's an emotional communication that must take place, and you must understand both are required in any healthy partnership, in a marriage. And so you have to, you have to get really good at being bilingual <laughs> when it comes to your communication. Like, like when your spouse asks you, would you marry me all over again on your anniversary dinner? <laughs> that, that is not a logical question. That is emotional, and you better start speaking both languages. <laughs> Yes, all over again, all over again, and then more, more than that, right? Like, they're logical and emotional. And if you don't understand that, when you go to communicate, you'll be at odds. You, you'll be against each other. And, and, and so when it comes to communication, you got to understand the logical and the emotional, and both are represented in a marriage because God has hardwired men to be much more logical and, and women to be much more emotional. And, and so it's important for us to realize that that the, really the key principle is becoming bilingual in our communication, right? And, and so as we do that, we'll discover um, that there's actually some, some issues that we can resolve just by learning how to communicate more clear. Um, also, as unresolved conflict is an issue and when it comes to our partnership with each other. Um, uh, it's important for us to realize that, that Dr. Gary Roseberg says it this way, actually. Let me, let me read this to you. The lack of emotional responsiveness rather than the level of conflict is the best indicator of how fast a marriage or relationship will decline. Focusing on what you are not getting out of the relationship and how your partner fails to live up to your expectations can kill your marriage in two to three years. So not only is it a communication issue, it's unresolved conflict. Because every marriage, you're going to fight. Like, I am, I am an eight on the Enneagram, if you know what that is, and so is my wife. And so guess what? We go, we go round and round. Like, I'll go 12 and she's like, let's go 13. And you want to go 13? I'll go 14. So we have some really good, hostile conversations. And there's nothing wrong with that because that's life. If you say you don't fight, you're lying, and it's not true in your marriage. Right? So it's, it's normal to have fights. It's not so much the, 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 the magnification of the fight. It's the unresolved conflict of those fights that can actually destroy your marriage in two to three years. So you can actually have more conflict, more fighting, but as long as you resolve it, it's not becoming a problem in your partnership. 
But when there's unresolved conflict in your partnership, in your marriage, it becomes a problem. It becomes an issue. It becomes something that actually divides you instead of brings you together. And as we know earlier, God says, I united them as one. And so what the enemy of our soul, the devil, this world, the culture wants to do is, is divide you, not unite you. And so you have to learn to resolve the conflict. Now here's the thing. You resolving conflict might look different than me resolving conflict. Like I know people that have been married for years and they have a fight and, and she goes and sees a movie and he goes and hits a bucket of balls at the golf range and, and they're good. And for some of you that would never work. And for some of you like, we gotta talk it out. And, and that may work for you, but if it's not working, then, then figure out a way to resolve your conflict. So in your marriage, there will not be the absence of conflict, but, but, but make sure there's, there's, there's the absence of unresolved conflict. Unresolved conflict. And so as you begin to understand the logical and emotional, become bilingual in your communication, and you resolve the conflict, and you learn how to communicate, actually you become greater partners and life becomes really fun because you have a deep friendship that makes a happy marriage. And you become a good communicator, which helps you become better partners, which is the way that God's designed you, even though we're different. Even though when the testosterone is flowing across the left and right brain of a man, it's flatlined. But in a woman, it's like, I see clearly the direction in which we are to go. It's not wrong, it's just different. And so the goal in marriage is friendship, partnership. And the third, and my favorite, is lovers. And I put it this way. And all the men are going to love this all the time. <laughs> Lovers all the time. 1 Corinthians 7 says it this way. But because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman should have her own husband. That's, a, that's good. Like, you only get one. Okay? The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs, and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. And so God wants you to be lovers. God wants you to enjoy life. Notice I said all the time. So like once a year is not lovers. <laughs> like all the time. Like all the time. Some of you have kids in the room, so I'm letting you have a minute to get them out of the room. All the time. As much as you can, humanly possible, have as much sex all the time. Or some of you are like, oh, 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 that's not what I signed up for you. Yeah, but that's God's intent for marriage. Lovers, all the time. It's, it's not good for man to be alone. So, so God gave him a helpmate, a, a partner, a friend, a lover. But, but here's the challenge of being lovers, and I think the church for too long has, has gotten it wrong. And some of you watching today are not a church person. you maybe not even a Christian. You're like, dude, I know where this is going. It's like, man, let's just put on a, a long dress down to the floor and no makeup and just, you know, sex is just for making babies. Uh, I think the challenge of actually being lovers is this, that we don't understand sex from a biblical perspective. We, we think it's just about procreating and making babies. And, and actually, if you study the Bible and you read some of the books of the Bible, particularly like in Proverbs 5, talks a little bit about it, jot that down, Song of Solomon. I mean, it is, whoo, it's not for the faint-hearted. It's not even PG-13. Like, there is, it is a, a lover talking to, his, to another, and, and, and talking about her in, in a way that's very graphic and very poetic, but graphic nonetheless. And so we don't understand God's gift of sex. He designed us to be sexual people, but he designed sex in the context of marriage between one man and one woman. So here's the key principle, okay? If you're married, notice the key word. If you're married, single people. If you're married, single again people. If you're married and you're dating, if you're married, sex is your weapon to protect your marriage, not just procreate in your marriage. And I added this little bonus. It's also designed to be pleasurable, or as we like to say around here, F. U N fun. And if it's not fun, you're doing it wrong, right? It's like the key principle. It's not just about having babies. The Bible is full of, of loving relationships and, and enjoying the pleasurable moments of, of sex designed for marriage. Outside of that, that's not God's best for you. It may be fun in a moment, but come on, remember we're not the swipe right culture. That's what culture is. That's not Christian living. Your sex life should be fun. It's not just to make babies, although that's important and that's part of it. Be fruitful and multiply. But it's to, it's to protect your marriage. Protect it. Guard it. Watch over it. 
Which is why I said you should be lovers all the time. Look at 1 Corinthians 7, 5 says, this is why, husband, wife, I want you to see this. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. <laughs> what? That's the only prescription that God says, hey, if you're not gonna have relational when it comes to your sexuality with your spouse and your marriage, this is the only reason, so you can what? Pray more, so you can know God more, okay? But afterwards, you should come together again so that Satan himself won't be able to tempt you because you have a lack of self-control. Woo! A little intense. <laughs> You're to be lovers all the time. All the time. Unless you decide together for a brief time a spiritual intimacy with God, but then you better come back together and go, hey, I want to keep our marriage protected. I want to keep our, measure, our, our marriage fun. I want to maybe make some babies, but we're going to have fun while we do it. As I always say, the fun is in the making. But can I just give you a thought? A pastor, mentor of mine growing up would say this. Um, uh, Sex starts with picking up your socks, gentlemen. <laughs> There's a great book that often I give to people and for premarital counseling called Sex Starts in the Kitchen, a.k.a. do the dishes, right, because it's emotional. <laughs> it seems illogical to you, but it's very logical and emotional. Do the dishes, pick up your socks, put your clothes away, do some laundry. You're going to enjoy that night. Lovers all the time. Don't deprive each other of God's greatest weapon in your marriage to protect it, to honor it. It's not in your notes, but the Bible says to keep the marriage bed undefiled. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that topic in just a few weeks, and so I, I don't want to get there yet. But Philippians, this is where we end, Philippians 2. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. This is Paul writing to the church going, hey, be like Jesus. Lay down your life. Serve others. Don't just think about yourself. Make sure this other person is fulfilled and content and happy. So in your marriage, listen to me. Be like Jesus. Serve your spouse. Become deep, best friends with them. Become partners. Be fruitful and multiply. And make sure that you become the greatest of lovers at the same time. And as you do that, whether you're married or you're single, when that person comes, you go, hey, this is the three ingredients to a great marriage, to a godly marriage, to what's best for me as a follower of Jesus. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you for every single person watching. I pray in this moment now you'd help those that are struggling in their marriage, that maybe are single again and desperately wanting to be married again, but I pray that they would be willing to wait for the right person, that that comparable helpmate, that partner, that friend, the ultimate that become a lover inside of the context of marriage. We thank you again that you're working and, and you're healing and you're mending and you're putting relationships that are broken back together by your spirit. In your name we pray, Jesus. And everyone watching said amen. I'm so glad you joined us. If you're taking a next step today, if you need help in your marriage, if you need prayer for your marriage, please let us know. Check out the box on the link and we'd love to follow up with you. As we close out our time together, I want you to consider partnering with us financially. As you give today, your giving is making a difference. Thank you so much for your generosity. And as always, Rock Creek, you're doing better than you think. God bless.